Hello, NFU community. I'm Sahar Salehi, Medical Science Liaison covering Southern California. We are here today with Dr. Pranav Garamella, Assistant Professor of Nephrology at University of California in San Diego. Dr. Garamella, welcome. Thank you, Sahar. Pleasure to be here. Thank you for being with us again. I wanted to start by asking you a couple of questions. Given your position at University of California, San Diego, or UC San Diego, as I'll be referring to it, how has your practice changed over the past six months in light of the COVID-19 pandemic? So I think that's the question that's uh, been asked most often with people who come to meet me either from a research perspective or the clinical leadership in the hospital, because I think we are in a situation that we haven't seen probably in the last hundred years with regard to a pandemic of this uh, extent, the scale. And the biggest, biggest concerns have of course been how do we keep our patients safe? And as you know, hospitals uh, are sites of infection. People who with COVID-19 have been coming in. So we've been trying to protect our patients as much as we can by opening up other opportunities and avenues for them to get care. For instance, previously, we didn't regularly offer video visits. The Centers for Medicare and Medicaid has significantly changed this by allowing patients everywhere, not just rural patients, but patients in urban cities in the setting of this pandemic to be allowed to do televisits. And so that probably has been the biggest change that we've seen, for one. Secondly, has it, we've also seen the increasing number of COVID positive patients admitted in the hospital, the admit, patients admitted in the ICUs, and the strain that it has put on the healthcare system with people who were perhaps not always doing inpatient medicine or people who were not doing ICU care, being asked to volunteer time, being asked to come in as backup calls. So those are the big changes that we have seen in the practice itself. Now, from a policy perspective, there have been a number of policies that have come down the pipeline with regard to payment models, telephone visits, the virtual visits. And I think all of that has really moved at a pace that we have not seen healthcare and innovation in healthcare move perhaps even in the last decade. And so it, is, it, it has been a time of flux for all of us, uh, a challenging time, and I think um, we have adapted well perhaps after the initial shock of understanding how um, perhaps prolonged this pandemic would be. Thank you for that, Dr. Garamella. Now, as a follow-up question, given the recommendations from the CDC for vulnerable patient populations to remain at home as much as possible and isolate themselves, have you found that there has been an increased demand from your dialysis patients to move from an in-center dialysis setting to a home dialysis situation? That is an excellent question, Sahar. As most of the viewership may know dialysis patients unfortunately don't have too many options if you're doing in-center dialysis. It's not like we can say we'll do televisits. You actually need to come in for the procedure itself. And that is three times a week, at least for most people, three to four hours in contact with other healthcare personnel and other dialysis patients. And if you look at the spectrum of patients who are at high risk for either developing or developing complications from COVID, it's the dialysis population. And so it has been challenging. And one of the things that happens is, although patients, although we may want to keep patients safe at home, they may not have the means to dialyze at home. And I think that is the biggest setback. And I think that actually dovetails into what the executive order from last year from President Trump has been doing to try and get more people to dialysis at home. It isn't because we felt safe from a pandemic that we were asking people to come in. For the most, it's because people don't have caregivers, they don't have the, the space, they don't have the technical expertise, or they have too many comorbidities to carry out itself. However, I think this is a much needed impetus for us to push home dialysis and home therapies more than perhaps what we were doing in view of the fact that we may see a second wave, we may see other pandemics down the line. So trying to encourage people to start at home and stay at home, uh, not just from a pandemic perspective, but for dialysis would probably be best for patients and caregivers in the long run. But this is something that 
the community as a whole, patient education, patient advocates, patients themselves, uh, physicians, nurses, um, and finally, the financial system has to uh, take the responsibility of moving patients out of in-center units. Definitely, thank you for that. So in a post-COVID-19 vaccine future, how will you be seeing your patients? Will it be more virtually or will it be more in-person appointments? So I think there are a couple of things that will determine that. One, of course, is patient preference. And I find it hard to believe that patients would want to go away from the option of doing virtual visits altogether. Now, it's important to keep patients in clinic. There are patients who need to come to clinic. There are patients who need to be examined. And there are patients who don't or who can't come to visit, perhaps because they are immobilized, they're in nursing homes, and it's a lot more work to get patients out there than perhaps what we can achieve. The second thing, of course, is how will the financial system regulate this? And that is yet to be determined because that may be a driver of how we practice medicine, uh, although that necessarily shouldn't be the case. Given an option, I think the telehealth visits are a must. They should continue and private insurers and CMS should hopefully continue to pay for this as we move forward because I find that a lot of patients have the flexibility of calling in wherever they are, if they're in town, out of town. Uh, the biggest thing that I hear all the time is they don't have to come and park anymore. They don't have to find parking in the hospital, which can be a problem for them. They have to walk three or four blocks. And so as long as we can provide safe healthcare in a timely manner via telemedicine. I think this should continue. I think and I hope that there are researchers out there looking at outcomes and perceptions and quality of life for patients in the setting of this pandemic and compare that perhaps to historical controls or to moving forward because that will generate the much needed data about what we are doing right now that can perhaps improve in order to provide quality health care. But I think telemedicine should be here to stay. So probably a mixture of both. Uh, I see right now about 30%, 40% of my patients in clinic, uh, as opposed to say two or three months ago where it was about 80%, 90% telemedicine. So patients are coming back, those who want to be seen, especially and who need to be seen. And I think we should offer them this opportunity to uh, make the choice. After all, medicine is all about making choices. It's patient-centered care. We'd like to offer them opportunities for treatment, and I think this is just as important. Okay. And do you think there are any disadvantages to having a virtual meeting with a patient as opposed to an in-person meeting? For example, yeah. um, you know, do you find that there's sometimes any difficulties in communicating with the patient that might be easier in person? Absolutely. And sometimes this is a challenge when patients either don't speak English or have uh, other family members who they often have bring with them to clinic to interpret. Uh, patients who have trouble hearing sometimes despite our best advances in technology, the, the voice may not carry very clearly. If I'm in a hospital and doing this, especially in a setting with a mask on top of that, patients who often tend to rip, lip read sometimes find it harder to understand what's going on. So, th so there are challenges. Uh, the question is how best can we overcome them? Um, I think the, the other big question that we need to answer is when do we need to bring a patient in? In a field like nephrology, we often rely on numbers. We're looking at lab values consistently, but as kidney function changes, as patients perhaps tend to get closer to needing dialysis, I think it's important to bring patients in regularly and, uh, and, and, that's, and that's what we do perhaps in the setting of a heart failure clinic, for instance, where assessing volume status and breathing and lung examinations are of paramount importance, those clinics perhaps may find it more challenging to deliver healthcare uh, remotely, although I'm sure uh, they're doing it excellently right now as well. Definitely, definitely. What do you think will be the main driver for the future of healthcare, given our current situation? So in this current scenario, I think the pandemic is probably going to decide how we practice healthcare, definitely for the next couple of years and perhaps maybe even for the next decade or so. The pandemic has already determined the speed at which drugs and vaccines are being developed. We have not seen that ever. The pandemic has determined how Medicare and private insurers pay uh, physicians and healthcare providers to provide remote services. 
I think there needs to be a huge investment in the infrastructure to provide these remote services, and these will really change how the treatments are provided during this pandemic and moving forward as well. So what is your biggest concern for the future of healthcare? Um, I think that's a loaded question. We probably have more than one uh, big concern. The, 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 the biggest, of course, is how long this pandemic is going to play out. As healthcare systems continue to be under uh, excess stress from the admissions for patients that they have and the, uh, the volume of cases that seems to be spiking, perhaps a second wave coming in, I think we need to have opportunities for patients to receive safe and timely care. And I think that right now is my biggest concern. I've had patients tell me that they don't want to come for dialysis because they're scared of a pandemic. I'm scared that these patients are going to be admitted in the hospital as a result of that and end up perhaps being infected in the hospital rather than coming in for dialysis, which would perhaps have kept them safer. So I think educating people, educating on the safety of uh, hand washing and masks and making sure that we can control this pandemic is well, probably the biggest concern that uh, healthcare in this country faces right now and probably globally as well. Yeah. And how has NEFU helped during this time of uncertainty within your practice? So NEFU has provided a large number of learning opportunities for some of my colleagues and some of my trainees. Uh, and I use this to direct them towards specific topics uh, in, in nephrology. I like the section on polycystic kidney disease. Uh, I have a special interest in that. And so I use the tools that are out there in terms of risk stratification, uh, simulated cases, when I do my teaching sessions or my lectures, I incorporate that from uh, NEFU often and I encourage my uh, trainees to go in and look at it. Uh, there's also non-polycystic kidney disease uh, information specifically on anemia and uh, the management of uh, mineral metabolism disorders and electrolytes. So those cases there and simulations are something that I like to use. Uh, we, we have to get innovative as we teach now we're doing mostly video conferencing. And so people will tend to zone if we don't have new things for them to focus on. And so I, th that's how I've used NEPHEW as a teaching tool, uh, mostly for my trainees right now. That's really great to hear. And I know that you are quite active on Twitter and you do follow Nephew on Twitter and you're aware that we post regularly. But out of curiosity, the nephrology department at UCSD, how active uh, are your colleagues on Twitter when it comes to nephrology updates and, and following different uh, nephrological societies or groups? I would say that we're still uh, a nascent division embracing social media compared to some of the other social media savvy programs in the Midwest and the East Coast that have large educational missions uh, built into their division and they have social media internships that they've encouraged a lot of their fellows to participate in. We have not participated to that extent. Over the last two years, I have convinced a number of my colleagues to get on Twitter. I have convinced some of our new fellows to get on Twitter. And one of the questions I often get asked is, how are you keeping up to date with all the information that's coming through? And it's, it's, it's hard to read all the journal articles all the time unless you're really scrolling through the table of contents. And so what I have done is I have curated my Twitter feed to provide me with high yield information and articles uh, and tweets. And so I often bookmark these from different societies, from people who are tweeting out and that's how, and then I download it and I forward it to my fellows on different, whether it's via email or text. So I have taken it upon myself to send two mails for new research, new publications every week uh, so that my fellows can read it. Because it, it's very easy to get overwhelmed and not know where to start. And so if you have someone doing the curating and sending you something, I think that that's always helpful. It is, and it's so important in this day and age to be on social media. That's the reality of it. Absolutely. I think I think as we move on, when you think about even recruitment for fellowships and 
uh, positions which are probably going to start happening remotely, having an adequate social media presence is probably going to be a very important factor in any institution's success. Absolutely. How can we at NEFU continue to improve awareness and patient outcomes? So I think there are a number of ways we can uh, improve uh, patient awareness. The first thing is give them the facts. One of the things that we are bombarded with constantly is misinformation and patients are receiving this just the way as uh, providers do. Unfortunately, they don't necessarily have the tools or the training to sift through that information. And so the responsibility of providing timely, accurate information rests on the healthcare system and the providers. So improving posted signs, perhaps in dialysis units or clinics, television ads, if societies and organizations are able to fund them, and maybe even billboards that say, wash your hands, make sure you are wearing a mask. Um, and for patients with specific disorders, it would then fall back on the providers. For instance, in nephrology, it's really important for us to stress on the fact that patients should be compliant with their dialysis therapies and they should not be missing them for fear of COVID because the risks associated with fluid overload and subsequent complications are probably just as high as uh, with uh, COVID itself. And with regard to patient outcomes, of course, I think uh, there are patient-centered outcomes that, that will uh, improve and there are hard clinical outcomes that we measure as quality metrics. In terms of patient outcomes, uh, improving adherence, improving visits, whether it is by maintaining telemedicine or telephone visits, and providing resources such as mail-in pharmacy services, co-pays for um, expensive medications, uh, patient assistance programs. I think all those things in this unforeseen situation will really help. A lot of my patients have either lost jobs or unable to work because of the pandemic. And as a result, some patients have been off their blood pressure medications. Some patients are considering halving their immunosuppressive medications when, when they're uh, taking them for a transplant. And so we need to make sure that patients don't miss these medications for their own good and for the good of the healthcare system. So there are a number of different ways we, we have to approach this. Um, and I think a one size fits all perhaps um, wouldn't, wouldn't quite work. Thank you so much for being here, Dr. Garamella, and for providing us with such insightful responses. The NEPHEW audience will greatly appreciate all of your perspective. See you next time, NEPHEW community.